Hey there, this is Patrice from PatriceWashington.com, where we chase purpose, not money. Welcome back to Redefining Wealth. It's a welcome back if you're an OG listener or purpose chaser, and it's a first time welcome if you are absolutely new here. I don't know if someone just suggested that you tune into this podcast or if you were divinely led here, if the podcast app angels (laughs) just suggested that you listen and you were drawn in, then I am excited that you are here. I'm grateful that you are here and I pray that you really learned something today. This is for me the kickoff of Financial Literacy Awareness Month. And I thought I would do a rewind for a couple of reasons in particular. One, I'm kicking off a Confident Money series next week. So stay tuned for that. I'm super excited about it. And the lineup is absolutely incredible. Like I'm Super excited, but I could not really get into recording all of it. I'm just going to keep it real with you guys. This past weekend, you probably have heard in the news a great deal uh, that a rapper, 33-year-old Nipsey Hussle uh, out of the Crenshaw area of Los Angeles actually was murdered in front of his uh, storefront, a store that my husband and I visited actually just a couple months ago. Um, and would go to from time to time because we're big supporters. That is the area that I grew up in. And so while I didn't know Nipsey personally by any stretch of the imagination, um, we do know people in common. We did know people in common. I found out that, uh, I actually used to sit on the school bus next to his cousin who shared a little bit about him on Facebook. And so I am just not in the headspace. If I'm honest, and instead of trying to fake it, my audience knows again, if you're an OG listener and a purpose chaser, you know that this podcast is an opportunity for me to share my heart. It's always like an open diary type of thing. And so my heart just says not to push it right now. My heart is telling me that I can grieve and mourn even someone I didn't know personally As I reflect how many times I walked down those streets and walked in and out of the stores in that area and how many times I probably shouldn't have made it off that intersection, but by God's grace, I did. And that for anyone who grew up in that area now or back in the day, I feel like for someone who was so committed to uplifting and unifying in revitalizing that community, it's just heartbreaking. It truly is. And so we're going to start this a little differently than I had anticipated, but I ask you for grace. Many of you are new here. And so you may have never heard this episode, but I still want to keep us in the vein of being aware for Financial Literacy Month. You know, we're not traditionally a very (laughs) money-driven podcast, despite the title, I do have some very specific tips I want to give you all month for this series. And I want to set the tone by going back to this rewind episode, which is faith cannot be your financial crutch. I think it'll be a great foundation as we get into the Confident Money series. So here's that episode. Enjoy this rewind and I will be back next week. Today, I'm excited. I always say how excited I am to get into an episode because I absolutely love this community and I love what I get to do every week. But this is one that has me a little, it's not nervous, but I know that this is a harder message, right? Because this is the one that's going to challenge some of you who actually really, really adore me. And this might be the one that makes us break up. (laughs) This might be the one that makes us break up. And I say when I'm speaking from the stage, sometimes the spirit will hit me and I say, you know, I'm not here to be your best friend because I can tell when people start to get uncomfortable when I start to step on toes a little bit and say things that challenge the very way of being that they have embraced for a long time. And so I know that my message is not always for everyone. And I know that even people who adore me are not always ready. They're not always ready to accept what I have to share. And it could be very well that I'm wrong. These are my beliefs. And that's the beauty of having your own platform. You can share your beliefs. But since I've been speaking at more churches again lately, I keep hearing some very familiar language that was, 
I don't think very supportive of where I wanted to go as I grew into adulthood. And so if you were raised like me, where you went to church quite often, I'm talking three, sometimes four days a week, and you heard a lot of the church rhetoric, right? About it's better to have a little and have your relationship with God or money is the root of all evil. I mean, just the the conversation that kind of made having money or material possessions or some level of wealth or access evil and being essentially poor or living from paycheck to paycheck more noble. And it messes us up. It makes us very conflicted when we get older and we're being encouraged to go to college and get degrees and get good jobs. And then you feel this internal conflict because you've also been kind of raised in a way to believe that those things are bad. And so I find that whether people have the great jobs or sources of income or not, they still tend, if you've grown up this way, to use faith as a crutch, as a financial crutch. And again, I think I may lose a few friends this week and I'm okay with that because I'm here for the stretch. I'm here for the growth. And I always say that this is something that I'm working through as well. This is something that we are growing through together. But today's message is, yes, it's a it's a little hard because if you call yourself a believer of any kind, if you subscribe to a certain faith, the reality is that that faith should not be your excuse for not being responsible. There are some things where you just don't need to pray about it. You need to plan and commit to it. Like there's some things where you cannot just be irresponsible, be footloose and fancy free with your finances and then pray for an intervention when you weren't praying for an intervention to do the right stuff. Right. And that's hard for some of us to accept because we've been accustomed to doing what we want to do and barely making it and then thinking that praising God and having a testimony or a praise party is the more noble thing to do. And I have to challenge that today. I really do. And like I said, it's hard because this is how I grew up. So this means I'm challenging my own family. I'm challenging my church family that raised me. I'm challenging close friends and their families because this is such an epidemic in the church world. And it may get me not invited to some churches. I don't know. (laughs) Invite me if you think your church wants to hear the truth about wealth and what's going on. But here's the thing. It just really comes down to this. We are living in a dispensation of time where we just don't have the time to be irresponsible with our finances. Faith without works is dead. And as much as we want to have our finances covered and we want to pray over certain things, there is a personal responsibility that comes with personal finance. And there is nothing left for you to technically pray about as much as there are things that you need to put in place and just do. So what I want to do is give you three things to think about today so that you can stop using your faith as a financial crutch. And before I jump into those three things, here's the definition of a crutch. It says a staff or support to assist a lame or infirm person, a lame or infirm person, a sick person or person who's just unable to walk. And then there's another definition that says anything that serves as a temporary and often inappropriate support, supplement or substitute. It's a prop. Anything that serves as a temporary and often inappropriate support, supplement or substitute, a prop. And what I see very often is that people will use their faith as a long term answer instead of just stepping up, taking responsibility and doing the freaking work like a temporary support but often inappropriate. That just stood out to me so much when I was researching this whole idea of being a crutch. And then when I looked at the word lame or infirm, 
like a crutch, a staff or support to assist a lame or infirm person. Most of the people that I know personally who use faith as a financial crutch are not lame. They're not sick. They're able-bodied. Most of them have some level of education. Most of them have come from pretty decent families, and yet they still use faith as an excuse to not get their finances in order. What is that about? How can we have or claim to have faith and then live this way? Live as if we're not able-bodied. Live as if we can't support ourselves. Live as if we're just too distraught, like just too unaware. I don't get it. I don't get it. Faith is not your crutch for not doing well with your finances. Faith is not your crutch for not budgeting. Faith is not your crutch for putting your name on things that you know you are no, in no position to pay back. Like faith is not the crutch for that. I actually think it's an insult. If you have some level of faith to make a conscious decision to go and put yourself in these different predicaments and then want to pray yourself out of them. But did you pray before you went into it? Did you pray before you signed on the dotted line? Did you pray before you swiped that credit card? Were you praying when you lent money to someone who you knew you were not in a position to give to? Or were you playing church and using this false sense of humility Oh, it's better to give than to receive to your own detriment when you haven't set yourself up, when you haven't taken care of your responsibilities. I know people who will give and give and give to others. And I don't mean giving to people in need. I'm, I mean, giving to Pookie and Tookie and them who, you know, <laughs> have no intention of paying you back just so that you can look like the savior. Meanwhile, you have children that are preparing themselves to go to college and you're not preparing for that day when they do go to college. So now we have children out here who are having to go into school, go 18 years old, signing their name to all kinds of debt because you thought it was more noble to look the part and give when you were not in a position to? No. And then pray about it? No. We're so excited when kids get accepted to school, but do we stand up in front of the church and tell folks how much debt we're putting our children in because we didn't have the guts to prepare for it? Now, I realize I'm saying some very blanket things, and this obviously does not apply to everyone, but if it does apply to you, I'm not here to chastise you. I'm not here to pass judgment, but I think it's something that we have to look at. And when we don't look at this faith pillar and how it connects to our finances, we're going to miss the boat. These are the things that unfortunately we don't talk a lot about in our communities. And again, I have three things I want you to consider. Faith cannot be your financial crutch. Number one, you have to know your own numbers. You have to know your own numbers. We are all responsible for knowing what goes in, what goes out. I remember when I was working with a nonprofit down in Atlanta and I did all the one-on-one -on -one counseling and coaching with the community members. I did all the financial coaching and I would ask people very basic things like how much their utilities were or how much their car insurance was or how much their car note was. And they would look up in the ceiling and their eyes would start to roll in the back of their head and they fidget and they move back and forth and they didn't know anything. And if I came and talked to you right now, if you're someone who has any issues in your finances, and I'm not saying that you're struggling or living paycheck to paycheck, but you have financial goals and you're not quite where you want to be. And I asked you a few basic questions about what comes in, what goes out, what are your goals, what are your fixed expenses on a monthly basis, what's your net income from your business, what is your gross revenue from the business. If I just asked you anything that had to do with numbers, would you know? Would you know? If you don't know the basics about the numbers, how are you managing things on a month-to-month -month basis? How are you setting up annual goals? How are you setting up quarterly goals for your family? Those goals could be how much debt you'll pay off or how much money you'll save or how much you'll invest. How are you setting any of those things up when you know none of the numbers? 
And I had to check myself on this recently, just within the last couple of months, because we do use a business manager to help pay our bills. And I found myself getting confused, getting too caught up and being on the road or doing this or doing that, where someone asked me a question and I didn't know. It was something that I always knew, but for the last like five months or so, I've just been off and haven't been paying attention. And I was like, wait a minute, what are you doing? And I still, my husband and I have to get back on top of these biweekly and monthly different meetings we would have about our business numbers and stuff. But I'm like, you have got to pull it together because as soon as something falls through the crack, the first thing you're going to say is, oh, Jesus, oh, Lord, I'm going to be calling on the Lord. But I should have just been opening up my Excel sheet. (laughs) <laughs> what does that have to do with calling on the Lord? I should just know what I have going on. How can I plan for the future? And I'm not even prepared. Like I'm not prepared to have a conversation about what my business looks like in 2019 because I haven't been on top of my 2018. I'm gonna keep it real. And so even speaking to myself, what's all this praying that you're doing if you're not practicing like you you have to practice how you want to play the game. If you want to play with big numbers, you got to know the numbers that you're starting with. You want more numbers to mismanage? You want more numbers to be unaware of? Let me tell you, these numbers get higher and higher and you are more and more unaware. You're going to pay more and more in taxes and people are going to overcharge and find little ways to sneak money out of your account and you won't even know. You won't even know. And so the first thing is, this has nothing to do with faith. You just need to know your numbers. That's it. The second thing I want you to consider in this faith can I be your financial crutches. You need to accept help where needed. Accept help where needed. So many times, because we pray about things, we think that means set it and forget it. I prayed about it. I'm going to release it. I'm going to surrender. I'm going to let it go. And then we're looking for a miracle. But what if the miracle is within man? What if the miracle is within a person that you need to have a conversation with? I am so grateful for my business manager, for my bookkeeper, for my financial advisor, for my estate planner. I am so grateful to have a team of people. And that didn't come once I hit six figures or once I start making more and more money or we started to. It didn't come with that. My financial advisor, I got when we were at the bottom, when you, if you haven't heard my story of losing everything and having to rebuild in the recession, like literally to the point of scraping of change, I hired a financial advisor a little after getting into my first apartment. And I think I might've still been sleeping on a mattress in Atlanta, little after getting off my brother's couch, getting our first apartment. So that was 2009. And I think I hired my advisor in 2010, we met and we've just built and grown together over the years. Since then, eight years in a totally different place. I think our first policy when we got life insurance again might've been 50,000 and now it's a couple million. I'm definitely not trying to brag, trust me. What I wanna do is just show that you have to start somewhere. And I needed to accept her help. And when I first sat down with my financial advisor, I said, you know, she asked me a few questions and I immediately went into, well, you know, this is what I used to have and this is who I used to be. And I used to have this business and da, da, da. And she's like, whoa, whoa, slow down. No judgment. No judgment. I just want to help you reach your goals. I just want to help you get to whatever is next for you. And we can start with whatever you're comfortable with, whatever that looks like. You have a child and if something happens to you or you and your husband, you know, you just want her to be protected. And, you know, we just start talking about stuff like that. And we talk every quarter. We have talked every quarter since then, since 2010. And she's helped us grow and grow and grow to what we have today. And so what did that have to do with prayer? Like, and and I'm I'm not I'm not minimizing prayer. You guys know I'm a prayer warrior. Like I don't play with my prayer time. I don't pray with any of that, but I don't like how we over spiritualize what it takes to have financial success. 
Like, I think that it is our responsibility to give God something to bless. And a lot of times we're not even taking the first step. So many of us are praying and then sitting and forgetting. Like we, we're just sitting down and waiting for, I don't know, lottery tickets or cash or something to fall out of the sky. And we're not really taking the appropriate action. And so having financial success on any level, whatever that next level is for you, is going to come from you taking action because faith without works is dead. And that comes from accepting help where needed. Now, we can't wait to join hands with our neighbor and share a testimony or a hoop and holler or, you know, some type of praise report from something else. But when it comes down to sitting with professionals and bearing it all and saying, I've brought myself as far as I could come and now I need help. We don't do that. I think that my financial advisor was heaven sent. She has been one of the biggest blessings to our financial growth. She introduced us to our estate planner. She works well with our business manager. Like she has been so instrumental in my husband and I rebuilding over the last eight years. And so many people would think I'm not going to get a financial advisor until I have this, 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 and this. Or they'll say, I don't want people in my business. I can figure it out on my own. Okay. That's not what you do every day. And I know financial advisors who have financial advisors. You can go back to our episode with Dr. Daniel Crosby, who was a financial therapist and a financial advisor who said he still didn't do his own investing or financial planning. He hired someone else. And so you have to be willing to accept help where needed. Who do you need on your team right now? What do you have questions about? Why are you still trying to Google your way there when you can get referrals? No one says that when you talk to someone, you have to go with the first person you talk to. But it's better to have them in your back pocket and know who you like, what what you like, what personality, what style of investing or what style of just work. Like it's better to just know and start to build that relationship instead of waiting until you might get some money. But then you end up with someone who's a charlatan. What good would that be? And the third thing is just nurture what you do know. Nurture what you do know. I hear so often about, I'm not good with money. That's never been my thing. I don't know anything about investing. I'm really bad at budgeting. I'm really awful at this. I hear, first of all, words are powerful. You ought to wake up every day with the, with the feeling that I'm ready, willing, and able to manage my money responsibly or powerfully or masterfully or whatever word you like to put in there, but that you are ready to manage your money and manage it well. And I tell people all the time, all of the things that you supposedly don't know about money are just a story you have told yourself. If you start to change the way you speak, you know words are powerful. If you start to change the way you speak, you'll be surprised at how all of a sudden you start to understand things with grace and ease. That's first of all. Second of all, are you even doing what you know to do? Because what you nurture grows. So let's say you know nothing except for you should budget. Are you doing it? Are you doing it? Are you consistently tracking what comes in, what goes out, comparing it to the months before and looking at ways to cut if you need to or how you can add to the bottom line where you can reduce things that are just not as necessary because needs and wants change for different people at different points in their life. Some things you felt like were a need last year are not a need this year. They're just not. And has your budget caught up to your lifestyle or or has your lifestyle caught up to the budget and what it should be? But what are those few things that you know to do? You may not know everything. That's why you have to accept help where needed. You may not know everything, but I challenge you to just do the things that you do know. Because if you did that, what you nurture grows. What we have with money is a relationship. So anytime we are more thoughtful, we are more strategic, we are more intentional, we spend more time on something, we're more invested, there is no way that that thing doesn't become better and better. It's impossible. It has to. That's my belief. 
And I always say, God, just bless my effort. I'm not the smartest. I'm not the brightest at everything. I'm in full awareness with that. But I will say, God, put your super to my natural. I just want to give you something to bless. Bless my effort. And it's amazing how I begin to hear about things or I just I'm able to see things differently. But I'm investing the time too. I'm investing in learning the things that I say are a challenge to me. Or I know well enough to hire the right people. I know just enough to know what I need to look for, what I actually want, why I want it, and the types of people that I like to work with. And then I go and find the support that I need because I know my numbers and I know what I can get and what I can't. And I know what I can do based on where I am. But I refuse, I refuse to make my faith my financial crutch. I'm not lame. I'm not sick. I'm not unable to walk this thing out. God has already given me everything that I need to be great in this area. I see way more for myself than where I am, but I'm okay with taking the baby steps. Like I think I said on a past episode, I'm not sprinting anywhere. (laughs) I get the long game here. I don't need a temporary fix. A crutch is anything that serves as a temporary and often inappropriate support. I don't need a temporary fix. I don't need something to prop me up. My faith is a part of my stability. My faith is not a crutch. It's not a prop. It's not a temporary inappropriate support. My faith is the thing that tells me that the universe is always conspiring on my behalf to bring all the pieces together for this puzzle. Now, it may come in seasons. It may come in waves. My job is just to continue to nurture the things that I do know, perfect them to the best of my ability. And by perfecting, I mean just practicing. I mean just practicing. I'm not saying that I have to be perfect because very far from that in every respect of the word. But. It's my responsibility to use what I have to get where I'm going. And too often we use faith as the scapegoat to not show up, to not do the work, to not be our best, to not nurture the few things that we do know because we're going to pray about it and God going to see us through. Don't you think God is tired of talking to you about the same things? I want to give God new things, new challenges, new seasons, new opportunities to blow my mind. I don't want my mind to be blown because my rent got paid. That's a given. I don't want my mind to be blown because I barely made it through. And I get that we are going through different things. And when people say, you don't know what it's like, I absolutely do. I've had eviction notices. I've had to chase a man out my apartment complex, the power man, and ask him to please turn the power back on with my baby on my hip. I've cried at the desk of a woman trying to apply for EBT, trying to apply for a food stamp card. I know. I know, and I know that the only way that I got here was through continuing to work what I did know, not complaining and whining about what I didn't know, and then talking about, well, I'm praying about it and I'm going to leave it there. That is irresponsible. And you could be mad at me if you want to be. I believe that that is irresponsible because I believe that you're greater than that. Don't you know you're greater than that? Don't you know that you're capable of more? Don't you know that if you truly have faith that you have everything that you need to get where you're going? It doesn't mean that it's going to happen overnight. It doesn't mean that it's going to happen tomorrow. It doesn't mean that it'll happen next week. But there is so much joy in the journey if you would just do your part. We have to show up and do our part. Faith can't be our financial crutch. You don't need a crutch. You need to get to work. You need to be committed. You need to be strategic. If you're going to set a plan, work the plan. Give God something to bless. Give him something to bless. And I guarantee you, if you keep at it, your finances will be barely recognizable. Barely recognizable. Your whole life can change in the next year. But what are you committed to doing? And it can change Quicker than that. Oh my gosh. 
When I think about the different times in my life as we've gone from level to level over these next several, these last several years, things that took people several years to do, we did in three months. We did in six months. I know people who didn't rebound the way that we did, but that's exactly why I'm sharing everything that I have learned in redefining wealth. That's why. It's not about chasing money. No, it's about doing the work on you. When you realize that faith is your companion, faith is complementary to what you put out there. Faith is not the crutch. Man, that's powerful stuff. It really is. And so while I know that maybe this came off a little harsh this week, I don't know. You guys need to give me your feedback. Seek wisdom, PCW. I always say I'm coachable. I'm open to your feedback. And I don't want to be insensitive to where anyone is, but I feel that, you know, I've always been passionate about financial education. That's how I built my first business, a real estate and mortgage company. But it wasn't until I lost everything and had to start over from scratch and scraping up change and going through some of the things that I just shared with you, plus much more that still to be unpacked as we go on. But it wasn't until all of that that I had compassion, that I had compassion. And so I have compassion if you are in a tough spot right now. I have compassion if you truly don't understand where your next meal is coming from. I have compassion if you've tried everything and you feel like nothing is working out and your back is up against the wall. I have compassion if you feel like you should have been the one who made it and instead now you are the embarrassment or you feel guilty or you feel ashamed because of some decisions you've made. I have compassion for you if you are going through foreclosure, if you've been through short sale, if you've had to file bankruptcy, if you've had a repossession voluntarily or otherwise. I have compassion because those are all things that I've been through. But I also have to stretch you to move past that and do your part to keep pushing forward. And when I see people who I knew pre-recession who still haven't quite bounced back from the real estate crash, I see examples of people who are not doing the work. And while those might be people that I know personally, and so, you know, we have this thing about you have to ask people if you can coach them. (laughs) Because I'm a coach, I naturally want to coach people, but I know that it's not always appropriate. And I try not to coach my friends and family if they did not ask for it. But I can't always share with them to the depth, you know, that I can share here. Like this is kind of my open diary (laughs) where I can say some of the things that I really want to say, but it was just on my heart. So again, I have compassion and I know what it's like. Like if you're struggling with any of the things that I just said, because those are all the things that I've been through. And yet still here I am. And I'm not perfect. I don't feel like someone who's made it. I feel like your sister on this journey. But some of you, I want to pull you along a little harder than I have to pull others. And I realize that I have a pretty great community who are faith-based. And so... I needed to tell you that today, that I don't want to hear you using faith as a crutch to not be your best self. You're not lame. You're not financially sick. You're not financially inept. You are not anything that you may be telling yourself. You are capable. And as long as you are ready, willing, and able, we are going to do this. But you have to be willing to do the work. You got to know your numbers forward and backward. You have to accept help where needed, even where you are, even just starting where you are. And you have to nurture the things that you do know. Whatever you know now, just do it. You can't not do it and complain. Doesn't go together. Okay. So hit me up again, Seek Wisdom PCW. If you haven't subscribed yet, I welcome you to subscribe. We put out a new episode every single Thursday, sometimes with me and my insights and other times with 
my great guests who help bring these pillars to life. And I just want to tell you again, I thank you guys so much for all the reviews and the ratings. Please keep it up. Don't keep us a secret. Share with your girlfriends. You might want to share this one. You might not. (laughs) I hope you want to share. Um, Yeah. And I really do speak at churches. So if you want me to come to your church and we can have a real conversation, I love it. I really do. I love being able to plant seeds and to really challenge us to go to the next level and grow to the next level. It's uncomfortable, but so much is happening in this stretch. So much. I keep having to check myself. You guys are like my accountability group because the more I share what I believe to be true, what I know to be true in many respects, the more that I share that, the more that it reminds me that I have to keep walking it out right alongside you. So again, I'm not the type that comes to point fingers, but I have to call attention to this and I want us to grow through it together, especially if you were raised in a way that taught you that using your faith as a crutch for your finances was okay. If you're going to be great and walk in everything that God has for you, it's not okay. It's not okay. You are still the CEO of your life. You are still responsible for the daily activities of your life. You're responsible for the budgeting. You're responsible for how you save, how you spend. You're responsible for all of it. Now, the CEO can do nothing without the board of directors. And in my life, the board of directors, three entities, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So if even believing that you are the CEO of your life is a challenge for you, I want you to think about it that way. The CEO really can only do so much. The board of directors is who's running stuff. But you're the CEO and you're responsible for the daily decisions of your life. So what are you committed to doing? Are you committed to knowing these numbers? Are you committed to getting real help, physical help from someone that you can talk to and who can hold your hand and walk you through these processes? And are you committed to just doing what the heck Big Mama taught you back in the day? The basics. Budgeting what you know, not overusing credit, saving 10% or more of your income, not lending money you can't afford to give, not co-signing on anything you're not willing to pay for. If you did the basics, where would you be? Hit me up, guys. Seek Wisdom PCW or join the conversation at redefiningwealthpodcast.com. And don't forget, I am here for one reason, one reason only. I'm here to help you live your life's purpose, find fulfillment, and earn more without ever chasing money. Talk to you later. Oh, yeah.